University of the Peloponnese, University of the Peloponnese is the first, uh, uh, let's say, mistake in, uh, in my oral presentation. Uh, we are very glad today that we have with us a very uh, distinguished uh, academic uh, and uh, analyst of the Gulf uh, uh, affairs. We all know that now Gulf, uh, Dr. Abdallah Baboud, uh, we all know that uh, uh, Gulf now is at the center of geopolitical affairs of the Middle East and beyond. And uh, perhaps it's the first time that uh, the what we used to call Arab order is uh, led by uh, countries that are in the Ar Arabian Peninsula and not in the Mediterranean coastline or in Mesopotamia. So it's, it's a historic moment for, for the region that we are uh, now. And I think that uh, uh, Dr. Babut is uh, the best to illustrate both the perspectives and the challenges of this uh, historical moment. He is uh, uh, now visiting professor in the University of Tokyo. He has been uh, also uh, uh, professor in the University of Qatar and uh, head of the Center for Gulf Studies in the University of Qatar and also head of the Gulf Research Center of the University of Cambridge. Um, he has uh, um, studied Gulf affairs and he has written uh, um, a lot of uh, um, academic articles in uh, scientific uh, journals. Uh, I, he has written a lot about the relations between EU and the uh, GCC countries and also about uh, Islamic radicalization in, both in Europe and, and the GCC and also on, on GCC geopolitics. Um, and so we are uh, fortunate enough to have uh, him among us today. Uh, he is now in Tokyo, actually, <laughs> digitally among us. Uh, and uh, without further ado, well, we would like to invite um, uh, uh, Dr. Abu to uh, start his talk. After, after you can you can submit your. Um, uh, questions and uh, comments in uh, the uh, chat of the YouTube and then uh, uh, Haritini Petrodaskalaki will uh, uh, collect them and present it to uh, Dr. Aboud. Uh, Dr. Aboud, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir, and thank you for uh, the very kind uh, invitation. Uh, I really appreciate that for uh, your invitation and uh, Zakia Akra for her kind approach and invitation and all your team have been very efficient. I apologize about um, connecting late. I just as just a small correction. I'm actually uh, at Wasida University, Wasida oh. and not Tokyo University, uh, okay. which is another university in Tokyo as well. Um, I don't know for how long you want me to talk for. So if you could um, just let me know uh, because yeah, I just can then just about uh, to about uh, 30 to 40 minutes 30 to 40 minutes okay well good evening to you good afternoon uh good morning it depends where you are uh or good day uh it's a pleasure to talk to you about um uh the um the um uh, the, the the gulf uh region and it is placed now within the middle east um uh, politics, uh, as it were. And um, let me start by saying a few things first about the Gulf. When, when the British withdrew in the 1970s uh, and uh, Pax uh, Britannica ended, uh, many people wrote the obituaries of the Gulf states saying that they are going to fall, they are not going to be able uh, to uh, continue as states without protection. These are very small states. They didn't have any experience in terms of governance or statehood, uh, etc. And, and there were a lot of uh, bandits, as it were, uh, talking about the fall of the uh, of the Gulf states. Um, however, now we are uh, 50 uh, years, five decades later. We've seen that these uh, states uh, have become are actually uh, not only uh, resilient to 
uh, what people thought, you know, that they would uh, uh, they were weak and, and, and vulnerable, but they are much more active than they were before in many ways. And we'll come to talk about that. Um, and they are also more prosperous uh, in many ways than than people had uh, had thought, and they are more stable than uh, even some of the countries in the Middle East. Um, but I think before I also uh, get on into the topic, I need to say that the Gulf states themselves, we have to remember, these are very modern states in many ways they are states in the 21st century uh, in in many respects however the way that they have been governed or they are governed is still very much um one could say middle ages that has that, that can create problems for these states as they go forward um and let me just explain that a little bit more um they are governed, uh, they are, as you know, they are monarchies. They are governed by royal families. Let's say they are governed by tribes, uh, as it were. And historically, there has been conflict uh, within these states between not, uh, there, are, there were conflict within the tribe itself, within the royal family itself. You know, brother against brother, brother against cousin, and, and, and father against son, and all of that, or son against father. And we have witnessed um, quite um, an upheaval in, in that respect. Um, that is slightly changing now, but it is still very much there. And that is one of the uh, issues that these states need to deal with. It's changing because uh, now, you know, instead of having uh, sharing the, the, the uh, if you like, the uh, head of the state, being the head of state between brothers, it's now going from father to son, as we are seeing in many, uh, or if not all, uh, the Gulf states. Uh, and that is somehow, there is some kind of a reform that's going on in the, in the monarchy. Um, without that, we could run into problems. But that itself uh, has also created the problem between, uh, between within the royal families, within the, uh, you know, the uh, cousins and the brothers and, 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 and so on. And it has also created problems with other royal families as well. You know, there is this, um, if you like, historical antagonism between the Gulf states um, uh, royal families in the past because of the making of these Gulf states. Uh, and, and some of the borders are contested, some of the uh, legitimacy is is being questioned, as it were, of this royal family or that, and that is still there, unfortunately, which still haunts the stability and affects the stability and security of the Gulf states. And also because of that, they cannot work and cooperate together, uh, 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 as one would had had hoped. Uh, and so. That is one uh, area that w one need to look. Uh, one one needs to look at when considering uh, dealing with these uh, uh, with these Gulf states. The, the relationships are very uh, intense, and it uh, it can vary depending on who is in power uh, today and who is gone tomorrow. Um, and and you know there, it's it's not. They're not states where they have institutions or well, if you like, uh, established institutions and separation of decision making. Decision making is the very in the very small hands of one or two people uh, at the top. Um, and they have been unable in many ways to kind of work together because of uh, their antagonism against each other and their rivalry uh, against each other. The other thing we have to remember is these, these are very rich uh, islands of prosperity and stability to a certain extent, but they live in a much wider uh, region and, and a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a sea of turbulence. The whole region around them is in, 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 in turmoil, as we have been witnessing. And basically, they live within 
you know, they're wealthy on one hand, but they live within a lot of hungry and angry people. Hungry because these countries, some of these countries are, you know, they don't get enough uh, economic development and, and, and because of the wars and the conflict, people can't even get the basic necessities. And very angry because of what has happened to them throughout their history. Um, um, whether it is in Iraq, Syria, Palestine, uh, uh, Yemen, and all of that. So you 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 are an island of you know wealth, stability, security, etc. But you live in in this sea of uh, very turbulent sea, full of hungry and angry people, and that really poses a challenge to uh, to the Gulf states. Having said that, we have to also think that five decades since. British, uh, uh, so uh, since the uh, Pax Britannica ended and the start of Pax Americana, we have seen these states, as I said earlier, becoming stronger and more resilient than many people had uh, not expected and had actually written them off. And But this region has witnessed at least four to five major wars in these five decades and one war is still going on and that is the one in Yemen but we've seen the Iran-Iraq war we have seen the invasion of Kuwait we've seen the uh, liberation of Kuwait we have seen the invasion of uh, uh, Iraq and we have seen a lot of other uh, turbulent movement uh, uh, moments in the region um, they have been able to withstand that uh, but those those kind of conflicts doesn't bode well bode well for uh, the region, and obviously the system that used to rely on the global system that you you used to rely, especially the Pax Americana uh, system that you used to rely on the twin pillar pillar policy that is Iran and Saudi Arabia collapsed with the Iranian Revolution. And of course, um, the uh, downfall of the Shah and what followed from there. So what we have now is we are in a situation where there is no um, strategy or American strategy towards the region. Um, and the American policy is very confusing to the region. Um, and, you know, there are lots of mixed signals and it is reliant mainly on military and intelligence cooperation, but it hasn't extended to much wider than that, you know, in terms of economic cooperation and uh, social and political cooperation. It's it's very much security oriented. And the pivot towards Asia makes these countries very vulnerable. Uh, the idea that the United States is going to focus uh, on China and uh, uh, and changes its energy more towards there, uh, and perhaps um, leave the Gulf. Although leaving the Gulf is not on the card, but the fact that it's not going to be less important to in their uh, uh, in their uh, uh, in the back of their priorities makes these countries feel very vulnerable, and they also feel very vulnerable towards Iran uh, as well. Because yes, you know Iran. Despite the fact that it is it's under uh, economic sanction, it has extended its influence in the Arab region, in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Yemen, and so they feel encircled by Iran, and they feel ab abandoned by their security partner, and that is the United States. And as you know, the European Union has not been uh, uh, very effective especially given the fact that the European Union uh, is, is a, a, a civilized or a civilian power. Uh, it doesn't rely very much on a military uh, uh, power, and that is still in the hands of member states. So, uh, and although there are some European countries that now have moved in, especially we've seen the French 
playing a very important part in the maritime security in the Gulf and the British as well uh, and, and some other uh, European countries that have joined uh, the, the maritime arrangements that has taken place there in the Gulf. Despite that, you know, there isn't really much in terms of European involvement uh, in, in the region. If anything, even the economic relations that Europe and the Gulf used to have is not as good as it used to be. And that is due to, of course, the change in the global political economy. Uh, less oil is coming uh, to Europe from the Gulf and most of the Gulf oil is moving to China and to Southeast Asia. Uh, and therefore, with it, it relations and investment and so on. So Europe is no longer the main trading partner that it used to be for uh, the region. Now, having said that, um, we are seeing also that this region does not have um, a regional order. Um, whatever that, that may be, we used to have uh, a semblance of a, a regional order, which was the uh, the Arab League, which, of course, as you know, the Arab League is no longer uh, effective as it used to be. And then the Gulf says, uh, because of the fear of a lack of regional order, they created their own uh, regional organization called the Gulf Cooperation Council, short the GCC. But we know that this GCC has also gone through a very difficult period because of conflicts between member states, especially Saudi Arabia, Emirates and Bahrain on one hand and um, uh, and Qatar on the other. And despite the fact there has been a rapprochement or some kind of an agreement, as, as it's known, the Ola, uh, summit uh, took place and they were uh, uh, and Qatar is back. But I think this has left a very sour taste in uh, everybody's mouth. And it's going to be very difficult to overcome this. So we, we you know, that uh, GCC as a regional organization is totally almost ineffective as it were now. And I think these countries as well um, have been engaged since their inception, since their formation of these countries, uh, they are pitting against each other for um, uh, for uh, dominance and for uh, some kind of a, a, a power against uh, their their neighbors, and that hasn't stopped. It's very much still uh, there and it's still very active. And we have seen that has uh, this kind of competition and uh, hegemonic competition and zero sum game is still going on, not only between the two Gulf regional powers in that sense, Iran on one hand and Saudi Arabia on the other, but even within the Arab Gulf states themselves, there is a lot of competition going on. And this has been um, exasperated by the Arab Spring and the changes that has taken place because of the Arab Spring. Uh, and in fact, the, if Arab Spring did anything to these states, it actually showed that they have to um, act more uh, than they were and that they actually have an agency and they have freedom to maneuver than, uh, than, than people expected. And especially given, of course, the U.S. Um, reluctant involvement in the region or the mixed signals that they get, they started uh, some of them punching above their weight in many ways. So we have seen the Gulf states involved in the Horn of Africa and, and uh, building even, you know, not only uh, uh, trade uh, ports and, uh, uh, and interests and investment, but also even building military, um, uh, military uh, bases in in uh, uh, in the Horn of Africa. And yet they are competing with each other, not necessarily working with each other. And they are exporting their conflict into uh, uh, North, uh, into um, uh, the Horn of Africa and East Africa region in, in many ways. And now we are seeing that um, the, uh, they are also acting uh, in the Mediterranean whether it is in North Africa, you know, Libya and, and, and uh, 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 as one example. 
and um, and of course in Syria as well, um, and they are getting involved even in conflicts within the Mediterranean, whether you know it's Turkey, Greece, and and all of this, and they're involving themselves uh, into that, and uh, obviously that also adds, if, of course, the the new Abraham Accord with Israel. Uh, which gets some of these countries much more involved with uh, uh, in, in the Mediterranean. And that takes them beyond, if you like, um, their capabilities and beyond their regional uh, 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 reach. Uh, because as you know, they have limited resources, despite what one thinks about them. They still have very limited resources in terms of military capability, in terms of economic and wealth, because their economic and wealth is now being highly challenged because of COVID and, and the effect of the fall in the oil price and the needs for development. Um, uh, and they are highly challenged internally because of their population looking for jobs and, uh, uh, and looking for better future. Yet they are much more, you know, involved and in spending their fortune and arms and armaments and uh, competing in different regions uh, in uh, around them. So that kind of competition is uh, is taking place not just in within uh, the Arabian Peninsula and within the Gulf, but it's it's now um, happening in uh, Africa and East Africa and Horn of Africa. Uh, uh, in the Mediterranean and North Africa. And that itself is actually uh, uh, quite interesting and quite interesting to watch and to see what can they do. These countries do not have even, uh, you know, the, the, the capability and the capacity to be able to deal with all these uh, uh, problems and these issues. And I think, you know, I said something about the lack of a regional order uh, that uh, has happened, which is, of course, uh, true. And it seems that we are seeing some competing paradigms. We are seeing that, you know, there is there is a move towards more democratization, the Arab street and the Arab spring and all of that. And with that, we have the Islamic uh, 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 groups that are taking advantage of this uh, uh, of this movement. Um, and we are seeing that there are can, some of them are against that and they want to, you know, contain uh, 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 and continue with the status quo and uh, supporting military regimes uh, and military coup against democracy. And they they want to stop any kind of uh, development of democracy in the region. Uh, on, on top of that, we are, we are seeing is that there are alliances uh, that are being uh, built between Iran, example, and uh, some of its neighbors in the Arab world, like Iraq and Syria. And even within the Gulf, we have, you know, uh, Qatar has good relationship with them, Oman has good relationship, and so is Kuwait. Uh, and then we are seeing, you know, the Turks are getting much more involved in the region than they were. And also some of it is due to the fact uh, uh, that uh, th th there was room uh, because of the conflict, the internal conflict between the Gulf states has allowed for Turkey to find a place uh, in, in, in this. Uh, and now because of the Abraham Accord, we are seeing Israel uh, getting much more involved in the politics. And now we are seeing that, you know, there is a tit for tat going on between Israel and uh, Iran, not only within uh, the Gulf waters, but also in the Mediterranean. And all of this does not really bode well uh, for, for a region that needs um to uh, to be much more stable it, it needs to be uh, uh, much more secure and the wealth of the gulf states that's been spent on these conflicts co could have been spent on um you know bringing peace and stability to the whole region instead of the instability that is uh, taking place it could you know the amount of money that has been spent on these conflicts and the competition 
uh, within uh, the Gulf, within the Arab world, but beyond, even in the, uh, you know, in, in, in international capitals like Washington, for example, uh, you know, paying off uh, the lobbyist groups and the media and all of that. So if some of this wealth as this money has been spent on the regional countries, we could have seen, you know, a revival of uh, place and more stability around them so that that rough seas that these islands are in could be more stable and we could have like a martial plan for for the region. Unfortunately, that is not happening. The competition that is between them, you know, this uh, ideological uh, tribal competition that I explained earlier between the ruling tribes is actually reverberating um, towards the whole region, exporting some of their uh, rivalry to uh, to the region, which does not necessarily help the uh, outer region uh, situated around the Gulf, and it does not help the Gulf states themselves. And even you know, some of the uh, and now some of the observers are saying that you know, with if this is going to continue it could actually uh, reflect back on the GCC states and the Gulf states themselves internally uh, because they are facing some uh, economic issues and economic challenges. And if they keep spending their money the way they are, um, they, you know, that uh, the Arab Spring um, is not just one off phenomena. Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, something that will continue for uh, a long time because you know people are actually looking for a better way of uh, of life and if these re uh, these regimes cannot deliver that they could be challenged in the future uh, these regimes are of course have created stability and security for the region uh, and but their legitimacy is being you know challenged now uh, with the fact that there are their economies are being challenged and the fact that they are uh, facing some uh, some of them despite being you know, uh, oil producing countries, uh, they're facing some of these challenges. So what is the region need is a new paradigm, a paradigm shift in the way that it works. And uh, if you like, I can, uh, and, and up here, I don't know how much time I've got left, but, um, um, and maybe we can uh, explore no, no, no. You, some you of can, these. You can, you, you can continue. It's, it's a very interesting point. <laughs> you, right. you have um, another five, 10 minutes, you have it. Okay. Um, well, I think what is uh, what 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 is needed uh, uh, in uh, here more than anything else is a, a new way of thinking, uh, and that new way of thinking is that uh, should be uh, maybe some kind of a regional uh, project, um, a, a regional structure that that brings all uh, the countries in the region together um, and to avoid these uh, these conflicts obviously we cannot uh, uh, no one can stop these conflicts from happening uh, there are historical as i said uh, conflicts that is uh, that has always been going there in in the region for a long time there are also ethnic as well as sectarian and religious conflicts that has uh, been taking place uh, and obviously there are political and economic uh, conflicts that are taking place as well and no one can um, deny this but uh, the world has learned how to uh, deal with these conflicts and there are other regions in the world has learned have learned how to do uh, uh, how to deal with these conflicts uh, and, and that is you know through dialogue through diplomacy, through negotiations, through some kind of structure uh, that 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 allows this to uh, to happen um, and and uh, uh, and dissipate any fear or misunderstanding uh, and you know build confidence building measures etc uh, between these countries that seems to be lacking. As I said, the Arab League is no longer uh, uh, the organization that it was. The Arab nationalism has um, taken a beating. Um, the, uh, there is no uh, other regional organization. Uh, uh, the Gulf states as well has, uh, as I explained, has gone through this. So uh, not saying that we can do away with 
uh, with these existing structures, but there could be an overarching structure that brings in other players in the region. Now you have to understand that the Middle East is not just made of the Arab uh, countries. There are other non-Arab countries in the region as well, and they have been excluded from this. Uh, and that is Iran, Turkey, perhaps Pakistan, perhaps Israel, and, uh, and maybe Greece uh, 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 as well that can have, have an interest in, uh, in the region. And why not bring in um, these countries into some kind of a superstructure that, um, you know, that can, uh, that the countries can actually work together because they have vested interest in peace and stability and uh, prosperity and they can cooperate in many issues that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that the whole region needed, economic, political, security, etc. Obviously, there is a need for something like that, and that is uh, uh, and that is uh, needed. But that also requires a new paradigm shift in the politics. You know, we we have uh, as, uh, and uh, and the ideology, um, uh, the Arab the Arab nationalism obviously has uh, seen its days. Um, the Islamic uh, revolution or the Islamic ideology. Uh, is not accepted by everybody and, you know, people are trying to move away from religious, uh, 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 religious, uh, if you like, ideology, uh, and especially that some of these ideology is being uh, associated with some of the uh, uh, conflicts in the region and, of course, with the wars and the proxy wars and terrorism and radicalization. Um, and unfortunately, there isn't anything in now there in terms of ideology that can bond these people together and, and create and bring their future uh, uh, together so they can work together. That that that, that is that is lacking. Uh, Europe is having its own problems, obviously, at home. Uh, the United States is having its own problems at home. Um, Asia is moving towards the Gulf, but very slowly and very carefully, and it, it, it will not uh, interfere. And the Middle East is left to uh, on its own, trying to sort out its own problems. And I think it should come initially from the Middle East, but it should be any any ideology or any um, kind of um, uh, uh, regional structure. Um, should come from uh, the Middle Eastern countries themselves and the regional countries, and then to be supported by uh, by others. Instead, what we are seeing is that a lot of proxy wars that, uh, that are taking place. Uh, there are really these are some of some of these conflicts are very very costly. Where you know we are seeing even the nature of conflict is changing. It's no longer you know uh, military to military. Uh, confrontation. We are seeing, you know, proxies, uh, non-state actors that are becoming very active uh, in this country and uh, this region. And this is where radicalization, this is where terrorism, there is where uh, uh, takes place and find uh, ground and uh, 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 an easy ground to, to operate when these countries are not working together. So and um, also the nature of you know of conflict has changed. You know, no longer you know having massing armies, you can now fight um, either through proxies or through drones. Uh, so um, that is also creating a completely different dimension of the way conflict is going to be uh, 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 you know conducted and and managed. And the challenges are huge. You know in terms of cybersecurity uh, to to the region, and this is no. There is no country in the region that can actually confront all of these challenges on its own. Whether it's wealthy or not, whether it has political support from international partners or not, first and foremost, it has to come from the region itself and through cooperation and through integration and through, um, you know, pulling their resources together. Unfortunately, we are not seeing that. Uh, we are, we are, we are, what we are seeing is more defragmentation uh, of the region. And to the extent that uh, the three most important countries that really now matters in the Middle East is no longer Arab countries. It's actually Iran, Turkey, and Israel. 
and you know this is how the the situation has become all these 22 arab countries have become almost irrelevant when it comes to anything uh, uh, substantial that you know deals with uh, with the region uh, because even saudi arabia with its weight cannot do uh, this and we've seen you know it's been re reluctant to get involved in some of the, these uh, issues and as you know egypt uh, used to be the uh, Arab uh, capital uh, and used to be the most important one, is no longer uh, in the Egypt we know. And, you know, we've seen that Damascus has also lost its place in terms of, you know, affecting Arab politics. Baghdad is the same. So the only actors that really now count in the region apart from those three powerful powers that i mentioned iran turkey and israel are very small actors like united arab emirates and qatar and to a very large extent these are very limited you know despite their ambitions and so on they are very limited in terms of their capacity and what and what, uh, what can they do or what, what not can uh, and what they can do um, is actually challenging um, and we're not seeing there is any kind of an Arab power, uh, whether it's a Gulf power or an Arab power that is actually leading uh, the or, 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 you know, leading the countries or leading the region out of its uh, uh, its mess. Uh, we are still very much muddling through this very, very rough terrain and we are still in the gulf um, still as i said islands of prosperity uh, islands of wealth uh, stability but only to a certain degree when you consider that you know the whole region around you is changing the whole region is in a turmoil the sea is uh, 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 that uh, that we uh, live in uh, as, as island is full of hungry and angry people and uh, there is a lot of instability uh, around us and there is a lack of uh, international interest as well um, in, in trying to resolve uh, the uh, lingering Arab uh, conflict. Uh, the Gulf states, because of their rivalry, because of their uh, historical antagonism and competition between them, have not necessarily helped uh, in a way if anything they are exasperating what is already a very tense uh, uh, situation and um, you know the the picture is is bleak especially when we consider that you know that uh, the future of oil is questionable um, you know the world is changing the global energy scene is changing Oil is no longer the strategic commodity uh, 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 as it used to be. Uh, there are competition, uh, uh, you know, whether it is shale gas and shale oil, but also there is competition from renewables and, and the oil prices are, if anything, they are going to continue to uh, to go down. And these countries have not been able to develop their uh, economies outside uh, the oil, despite the many plans for diversification and they are going to face challenges because they have very young population that are very ambitious and they are uh, very educa highly educated some of them went to western countries and uh, uh, and to eastern countries as well and they want to see change and they want to see a difference and they want jobs so for, first first and foremost and that is not not taking place even countries with wealthy countries in the gulf are now facing problems with employment um, uh, and finding jobs for their young people so um you know with with this very kind of complex picture and scene um the the, the global uh, scene the uh, regional scene and also the domestic scene within the gulf state it, all of it doesn't really bode well for uh, the Gulf states, despite the fact that, you know, they have shown to be much more resilient and much more powerful than people had initially thought. And yes, they are 
now, uh, um, you know, punching above their weight. They are, uh, they are, in fact, dictating uh, their policies to the traditional Arab leaders uh, and Arab countries. Uh, and they are, um, um, you know, their outreach has become very uh, important, you know, whether it is in North, in North Africa, in Horn of Africa, East Africa, the Mediterranean, etc. And, um, you know, they, they're still uh, uh, major players, but the seeds for their problems is still there and they're not trying to confront it. Uh, and they are not trying to find a way out of it because this mentality of you know uh, competition between them and who gets what who's who partners with whom is still very much uh, the uh, you know the modus operandi within uh, these countries and they have not learned so from the European experience that you know that stability comes from uh, regional cooperation and from uh, regional stability and regional uh, integration and, uh, and economic cooperation. Uh, you'd be surprised that, you know, the Gulf um, you know, produces uh, enormous amount of energy uh, and, and, and sells it to the world, yet, you know, uh, uh, and especially gas, and yet we see some of the Gulf states actually importing gas from Russia. That exists, just give you an example of a lack of cooperation that is taking place uh, uh, in, in the region. Um, and, you know, there are so many regional projects that has been uh, thwarted because of this uh, lack of cooperation and lack of working together and lack of, you know, uh, understanding that we have a common destiny and we have a common future and we've got to work together and learn from you know, other people's experience, like, for example, the European Union and how it was built on, you know, uh, uh, a very conflictual uh, European history and uh, it overcame that. We still not in that level to be able to, you know, to think ahead and, and build our own uh, future. And in fact, if anything, you know, as Arab countries, we have lost the ability to uh, decide the future of the region. As I said, you know, there is um, now there are three regional non-Arab powers are the ones that are dictating or at least uh, determining the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the the future of the region. And we are seeing that there is going to be like an ally alliances between uh, some Arab countries, either with Turkey or with Iran or with Israel. But, you know, the whole idea of having a Gulf or an Arab uh, alliance uh, has has almost dissipated and no longer uh, exist. And what does that mean for the future of the region? It's difficult to tell, but it, I don't think it, it bodes well. Um, and, and this is why it is really important to have a change of uh, uh, ideology, a change of, you know, a paradigm shift in the way that uh, that the region thinks. Otherwise, we are heading towards uh, more, uh, more more problems and more uh, conflicts. With that bleak pictures, maybe I can leave you <laughs> uh, 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 leave you there. I hope I have not upset many people, but uh, I'm happy to uh, you know engage and ask, answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for such a well structured and uh, very enlightening. Uh, uh, talk, uh, uh, you put many uh, things in uh, in place uh, because, you, you know, we talk about the Gulf and uh, what is happening there, but you put uh, a lot of things in place and also you gave us a perspective and I wouldn't agree with you that, of course, you, you describe a bleak picture of today, but you also gave a, a potential, let's say, uh, exit from the situation uh, through regional, through the, the scheme of regional, the overarching, as you said, uh, uh, scheme of uh, uh, plan of uh, regional cooperation, which I found very interesting. Uh, as I, I personally participate in such, a, in such an initiative, uh, the, what we call uh, the Rhodes Regional Security Conference in uh, 2017 and 2018, which actually brought together 
most of the countries that you are, you are talking about, we didn't have uh, uh, Pakistan, but we have uh, most of the other countries that you would get to mention. In, that was in uh, Rhodes Island in Greece. Uh, it was an initiative of the Greek government at that time. Uh, actually, um, taking advantage of the prerogatives of the, of the uh, let's say, moderator, I would like to make the first two questions to you. One is uh, 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 we're about China. Uh, we we uh, have read a lot about uh, China's role in the Middle East. Uh, uh, people uh, even uh, um, think about replacing uh, uh, United States in uh, granting protection or political uh, military umbrella to the to the Gulf and uh, um, the Middle East generally. Uh, how do you uh, how can what your what your comments what your thoughts about that? And the second is um, a more specific one, but has to do with the, the regional cooperation that you mentioned, and a specific example of uh, uh, regional cooperation, which is the um, uh, uh, re re rebuilding Syria. And uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, uh, Middle Eastern, particularly Gulf countries, uh, involved involving or getting involved in the, in the uh, rebuilding of Syria with certain, of course, uh, um, uh, terms and uh, conditions. Do you think that the, such a project, which is a huge project, actually, the people say that there's uh, more than $250 billion that are needed for the, for the rebuilding of, of Syria, do you think that this is a point of that can create a, let's say, an opportunity for regional cooperation uh, among the Arab states or, or among Gulf uh, states and uh, in the region? Thank you, sir. Uh, those are two very, um, very difficult questions and very important questions. Um, let me try and um, tackle the first one. Um, I think what your question about China's role in the region is a very, very important question. It's like actually in the, it's a question in everybody's mouth at the moment. You know, given, of course, uh, China's um, very ambitious uh, uh, Belt and Road uh, Initiative, uh, BRI as it, uh, it's known, and also its maritime component of that, um, uh, the Middle East has uh, uh, has become an important part of this strategy, and we have seen that China is moving in. Um, first of all, it's becoming um, the major taker of Gulf uh, uh, hydrocarbon uh, exports, um, and also it is moving in in terms of investments in the region. Um, and controlling of ports and uh, along its uh, ambitious uh, plan, as it were, the maritime route, um, not only in the Middle East, but even in Europe. Um, they've, they've moved so fast in, in, in that sense. They are investing heavily in um, some sectors, especially oil-related sectors and, and technology and so on. Obviously, um, with the uh, Middle East in dire need for capital, uh, China still uh, proposes itself to be one major partner that can bring in capital when actually the, um, the United States nor Europe has been able to do so in, in, in the Middle East, despite a very long established relationship. But even if they did, it was very, very limited. Um, as you know, you know, U.S.-Arab cooperation has not really yielded much and U.S. Uh, and EU-Arab relations or EU-Gulf relations has not really moved beyond the rhetoric, uh, uh, as it were, and, 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 the, and just the nice diplomacy. Um, well, China is, is delivering uh, in, in many respects to these countries. Uh, and... Um, and of course, the United States that has always been, if you like, the security guarantor for the Gulf region and for the oil uh, and maritime uh, security uh, uh, there, had always been calling for burden sharing um, and, and accusing other countries like China, Russia, 
mainly China and Japan and so on, that, you know, you are benefiting from uh, uh, our, you know, our means U.S. Um, uh, support for regional security and maritime security, but you're not sharing anything. Um, so there has been a push or a nudge for these countries to get involved. However, there, lim there are a limitation. Um, none of these countries, um, and if we just take China, for example, they, none of them can yet project power um, that the United States or even some European countries can do. Um, China is still, despite being the second largest um, spender on arms uh, uh, and defense uh, after the United States, but still very, very far in terms of how much it spends in, uh, in this sector. And its military and its capabilities are very, still very far away from what the United States is capable of. And, and China is not yet a naval uh, uh, or a blue water uh, power. Uh, it only has two um, aircraft carriers, and I think it's building its third. Will the United States have something like 20 aircraft carriers? So there is a diff big difference where, you know, when countries, when it comes to crux of the matter, they can project power, and uh, China does not do that. And I don't think China also um, wants to do that for many reasons. Uh, um, one of the reasons, obviously, is they don't want to get involved in regional politics. They want to stay away from it. They want to work on the economics and trade and investment and, and stay away from any kind of, uh, uh, of conflict. Um, um, and that and, and that cost them uh, as it were. And the other reason is that they're not ready uh, to to get to that level or to confront other uh, and, uh, you know uh, the, the the current hegemon, the United States. So they are willing to play the secondary role and very qu um, quietly building their capabilities to to do so. So China is not going to be the uh, country that is. Uh, one can look upon to um, to uh, protect uh, the region. Obviously, it has started to build some bases around in the region. As we know, there is a base uh, in Gawadar in Pakistan. I think there is one in East Africa, but still limited in, in many uh, respects. So uh, I don't think uh, neither China wants to do this, nor the Gulf states are actually reliant on china and they know that you know that that uh, china will not come to help them when it comes to uh, any regional uh, politics and especially given china relations with iran that makes them even much more suspicious about uh, uh, chinese uh, encroachment in uh, in the area they want to deal with them in terms of politics uh, in terms of uh, uh, economics and investment but they still think, in the Gulf at least, they still think the United States is the only power that they can count on. And they obviously want the United States to continue. And they don't believe, although they fear that there is going to be uh, some draw down on the uh, American power in the region, but they don't, don't think that the United States is in a hurry to pull out because it has still a lot of vested interest in the region and it has built a lot of bases, a number of bases there that are going to be very difficult to replace. And they don't want to see either China or Russia moving in there. So I think the, the Americans will continue to uh, to be there, maybe at a reduced uh, kind of level. I think they are also trying to reduce the tension, as we are seeing with the new administration, you know, the negotiation with the GCPOA, pushing both Iran and Saudi Arabia to talk together. And there are talks that uh, or at least there are leaks that they are they've started to do so in in Iraq. Um, it's uh, uh, it's uh, the United States is withdrawing its forces from Afghanistan and uh, Iraq as well, um, um, and also it's pushing uh, the Saudis to stop the war in Yemen and you know trying to um, and, and and listed the Houthis from the terrorism list and trying to find a peaceful. 
solution uh, or resolution to the war in Yemen. So it's, it seems that the United States want to resolve this conflict and tensions um, so it can it, it no longer has to be um, involved in, in those kind of conflicts. And, but I don't think China is, is in a position to do so, and certainly not Russia, um, although Russia is looking over the shoulders to see what opportunities are there for it to, uh, to find a foothold in, uh, in the region. <coughs> Excuse me. And then as, as, as your uh, second question, I totally agree with you. Um, the conflicts and the, uh, the repercussions of the Arab Spring or the outcome of the Arab Spring has been what we are seeing is, is uh, failed or failing states. Um, you know, because of the way that it's been handled um, and the history of, you know, the trajectory of this Arab uprising and uh, the, count the revolution and the counter-revolution and the involvement of regional uh, powers. Uh, and now we are, you know, Syria is one, obviously one major uh, concern and one major victim of this. Um, and uh, whatever happens in terms of uh, you know, reconciliation within Syria is one thing, but you know, how do you reconstruct Syria is another. Um, um, and that I think also goes for Yemen as well. Um, um, you know, because of these conflicts that have taken place uh, in the region, these two countries are obviously the most badly affected and the most uh, 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 countries that need uh, some uh, uh, rebuilding a reconstruction and post-war uh, reconstruction. And that, that can only happen with international cooperation and regional uh, cooperation. No country on its own can, can, can help that. And I think given the fact that oil prices is down, uh, the Gulf states are facing physical uh, uh, deficits and economic challenges uh, as I try to explain, and trying even to find jobs for their population, and trying even to you know find uh, make ends meet uh, in 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 some respects and balance their budget, they are going to be very challenged on their own to help any of these countries, uh, and that is something that we really have to think of. Obviously, they still hold very some of them at least all the very large sovereign wealth funds, which they have kept for, um, you know, after oil runs out or for future generations, as they call it, uh, and they don't want to spend all of that uh, either in, you know, rebalancing their books or uh, in, um, helping other countries, but they they have the ability to do so, and obviously they will need to uh, to support the, the region because uh, an unstable region and uh, is going to reflect badly on them. So, but I think they need to do it within an international context. And, and that is, you know, bringing in uh, the European Union, uh, the United States, um, China, Russia, all the, you know, the powerful countries as well to help uh, 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 support, uh, you know, the uh, post-war reconstruction in Syria and in in, in Yemen, um, because these are the two countries that are most affected. Iraq has its own oil, and obviously it can uh, help itself. Libya has its own oil, and it can, to a certain extent, help itself. But uh, Syria's uh, you know resources are very limited, and, and and the devastation there is much beyond everything. Like the figure that you mentioned, you know, similar figure or so is also about Yemen. These are going to be challenging uh, to the Gulf states and to the world. You know, where are they going to find the funds to be able to uh, to do so? And we have seen, you know, some of the um, the donors for Yemen. You know, um, the, one of the recent meetings that it was really a uh, uh, very visible uh, amount of money that were uh, uh, pledged uh, by. Uh, by the global community to help Yemen, while Yemen also needs are t t tremendous, and you know the, the people there are on the verge of uh, poverty as well as in Syria. 
So yes, you know, all of this adds to the challenges that the region needs and adds to the idea that they need to work together. They need to work as a, a regional organization, they, a, a regional uh, uh, grouping that, you know, that they can benefit from, uh, and, uh, from each other. No country on its own can do that. Not Saudi Arabia uh, with its wealth, not the United Arab Emirates, no Qatar can do it on its own. And even you know them some, themselves, they cannot do it. Uh, so where they are also being challenged, and we know that even the global economy is being challenged now because of the effect of COVID. So you know all this, all these conditions don't really bode well uh, uh, for the region, and you know um, they're not necessarily going to be able to raise. Uh, these funds, so you need financial, you know, international financial institutions as well involved. You know, the World Bank, the IMF, and uh, and, and all of that. And only through international regional cooperation that um, that Syria and Yemen could uh, be being brought back into, um, you know, from their uh, if you like failed state situation to. Uh, uh, to a modern uh, modern state, and as we are talking, there are some other Arab countries that are on their way to being failed states. So it is it is really a, a very a challenging uh, a challenging picture, I'm afraid. Thank you. I'd like to ask now some uh, uh, if some someone from the panelists from the rest of the panelists, uh, Dr. Draplarakos, uh, Dr. Eleftheriadou. Uh, Zaki Akra or uh, Haritini have any questions uh, before going to the questions from the from the public? Stavros. Uh, yes. Hi, Dr. Stavros Akularakos is the is the senior is the chief editor of our uh, uh, journal, uh, the Middle East Bulletin of Semis. Thank you. So, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I will be very brief because we have many questions from the chat. Uh, so I wanted to touch on um, on the Abraham Accords. You mentioned them uh, briefly during your presentation, but uh, I want to ask about uh, this uh, rapprochement with uh, between Israel, uh, the Emirates, and Bahrain. Um, we we, are we slowly seeing a, a sort of economic rapprochement? How is this? Uh, how is the, the rapprochement uh, seen in uh, recent months? Uh, are there any news about um, uh, some sort of security or military know-how exchange? You mentioned that uh, um, there are new ways of uh, proxy wars now. There are new ways for, uh, for uh, the regional uh, antagonism in the region. Uh, we haven't seen anything between uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia, but uh, I guess my question is, uh, has the rapprochement with Israel changed the uh, regional dynamics in the Gulf? So that's my question. Thank you. Do you want me to answer or do you want to take other questions? You, you can you can you can answer. Uh, you can answer yeah. this question. This question. Yes. OK, thank you, uh, Dr. Stavros. Um, um, that is a very good question, and I think it is very difficult to tell because it's still at the very beginning. Um, obviously, um, any peace in the region is welcome, um, and I think that is something we have to uh, always take into consideration. Or any movement towards peace is is welcome. However, um, I say that with qualification. Um, um, there is an Arab peace plan that has been put for a very long time, since 2002, uh, that recognizes Israel and accepts uh, the relationship, uh, normalizing of all the Arab countries' relationship with Israel, not just one or two countries, but all the Arab countries, and full normalization with Israel based on certain conditions. And, you know, um, uh, and, and those conditions are basically also relating to international uh, law and uh, United uh, Nations Council resolutions. And, um, and that would have been obviously something much more important if there was, uh, if this was 
um, if the Arab peace plan was actually advanced or negotiated at least and fine-tuned to be acceptable to everybody and, and have a much wider regional uh, peace plan. Now, uh, instead, what we are seeing is that some countries, because of one reason or the other, started to do that. Egypt, Israel, of course, you know, the, uh, the famous uh, agreement between them and then Jordan, uh, uh, etc. And there was, they were done for different reasons and at different times, but uh, none of them has actually brought peace to the region uh, or, uh, or, or, or beyond. Uh, and now we are seeing um, the Abraham Accord, uh, which is, uh, which, you know, if you really want to be uh, uh, more open and frank about it, it was, it was a relationship that was already building up anyway, and it was all under the table. Um, um, and again, some of that is not necessarily due to want to make peace, with Israel, but 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 because of this building of alliances and and strengthening ones, you know, back as it were, and because of this uh, regional competition and, and animosity and rivalry between the Gulf countries, uh, some of them have been dealing with Israel anyway, uh, and now they've been brought to the forefront uh, for again uh, different reasons. Um, and, and unfortunately, um, from my perspective, I don't see this is uh, as much as I welcome any peace initiative. I don't see this is going to be moving any further because it hasn't really tackled the core issue. And that is, you know, uh, the, uh, the Israeli Palestinian issue. Unless you sort out the Palestinian issue, there is no conflict between the other Arab countries and Israel uh, as such. The Arab countries are against Israel because, because Israel has done what it's done to the Palestinians. And it has, you know, uh, not accepted any uh, international uh, uh, laws uh, 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 and that, and is still occupying Palestinian land and Arab land. Um, and, and therefore, that was, that was the reason for the conflict. Or what else do we have conflict with the Israelis? We have no conflict in the Gulf with the Israelis, you know, apart from this fact. And if this fact is not resolved, um, then uh, it, it, it doesn't really, uh, the, this Abraham Agreement doesn't really mean much to the general public um, and, uh, uh, and, and also to peace in the region. It does not necessarily make, for, for Israel, obviously it's celebrated because of internal dynamics, etc. For uh, Bahrain, to be honest, I feel that it is, you know, it's just been nudged into moving into there, but there is not much that Bahrain and Israel share uh, uh, with each other, um, apart from maybe some security issues against Iran. Um, but I think the main um, two parties here is the United Arab Emirates and, uh, and Israel. And the United Arab Emirates is also, you know, trying to find because of this shifting of alliances and because of this fear of being surrounded um, and, and antagonism and mistrust and, and rivalries within themselves, within, you know, not even talking about the outside, but even within the Gulf itself, even within the Arab Gulf states themselves, without having to mention names of which countries is, but it's obvious, and also within the region, you know, with Iran, etc. Um, they feel that, you know, um, they can, uh, Israel can be of, of value to them uh, in many respects, um, um, you know, security, intelligence, uh, etc. But also getting political favors in, in, uh, in the White House and, you know, getting their uh, arms approved like the F-45, uh, uh, F-24. Uh, Etc. Um, so um, um, you know there are maybe bilateral benefits to this country, but it's not necessarily a regional. Uh, uh, there are no regional benefits that we can see. The regional benefit that will come is from a long uh, and, and, and comprehensive peace 
between the Israelis and the Palestinians and the neighboring countries. And if that was to happen, if the Arab peace uh, plan was uh, actually advanced and negotiated on, on, on its terms, and maybe with some you know changes here and there, that would have been much better to uh, a more comprehensive peace and, uh, uh, and accepting Israel into the region. I don't think the Arabs really, as people you know, uh, propose them, they're not necessarily against Israel, as I said. They are against some, some of these policies, which is you know, occupying Arab land, occupying Palestinian land, treating the Palestinians as it were. These are the issues that, that really bothers uh, the Arabs in, this, uh, you know, in the street. Um, and if that can be resolved through a comprehensive peace, then it would have been much better. But just having a bilateral relations that was under the table, it was already um, you know, taking place, and now just making it um, um, uh, obvious uh, and you know, going for that ceremony in Washington, as we know, it was just you know, a show. But it's not necessarily going to, uh, uh, going to either resolve the Palestinian question or is not going to help the peace that we uh, that everybody wants to have uh, in the region and i don't think it helps the israelis i don't think it helps the palestinians i don't think it helps us at all it's um, uh, you know for some it could be beneficial because of uh, you know own vested interest uh, but not necessarily for uh, for the region that you know we hope to have, which is a region that it is at peace with itself, and uh, a region that has, you know, uh, that uh, everybody has their own rights, and obviously, first and foremost, is the Palestinian right that needs to be recognized uh, in, in, in this respect. Thank you. Now I'm turning to Mkharitini uh, to give us a, a couple of questions, two or three questions that we have from the public, because I just informed, I was informed that uh, there are a lot of questions from the public. So uh, give us the first two or three, depends, and uh, then we, we go ahead. Uh, it depends on the time, of course, because we are going to uh, finish by uh, in uh, 20 minutes, around around 20 minutes from now. So we, we because we are we would like to allow also uh, uh, Dr. Babu to uh, have a rest after a very hectic day, as I suppose. <laughs> It was a very hectic day today. Yes, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Dr. Babud, uh, thank you very much for your uh, very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, we, uh, as we said, yes, we have uh, more than 10 questions from the audience, so we'll try to uh, go over as many as uh, we can. So, the first question is actually my question, and uh, I I would uh, like to ask, uh, to ask you about uh, the position of Oman because it's been a year since uh, the succession of uh, uh, of the new Sultan to the throne of Oman and Oman being a very great stabilizer in the region. Uh, would you like to comment how the succession has impacted or not the regional balance in the region? Uh, this is the first question. So I will uh, add uh, two more. The second is uh, about the uh, if you think there is a possibility of uh, a collective dis a defense team uh, among the countries that have uh, signed the Abraham Accords. Uh, you have uh, somehow touched upon the subject, but I would like to, I wanted to uh, also ask you here. This and uh, the has been, third question, Cardini, this subject has, has already uh, so has already been addressed. Uh, yes. In, okay. In mm -hmm. All right. And uh, the third question is uh, uh, a. It, says it would be interesting to focus on the domestic repercussions of the global economic crisis and if there is a state, for example, uh, that has been more influenced by the current uh, situation on economic terms. Okay. You can add one more. You can add one more. Because uh, okay. we, we, we scrapped the, se the second one, so we can add more. All right. So the, the new third one is that... that it, uh, if uh, a rapprochement between uh, the Muslim brothers and their arch enemies in the Gulf countries uh, is possible in the long run, uh, in the light of the recent GCC reconciliation. Can you can you repeat the last one? Sorry, is there? So, uh, is there a rapproch a rapprochement between the Muslim brothers and the Gulf countries possible in the long run, in the light of recent GCC reconciliations? Okay. 
Thank you, Haratini, for these uh, uh, very important and interesting questions. Um, uh, as you know, I come from Oman, so maybe you, that's what the reason you asked me uh, that question. I, I think uh, Oman has always tried to play this balancing role between uh, uh, the regional powers and, uh, and the regional countries. And obviously for very self-interest, but also it also comes from the ideology and the culture of uh, the people in the country and the perception of its leadership. And uh, as you know, Oman had had a, a very important role in thwarting and, and, and avoiding any conflict in the region and amongst them. Uh, uh, the well known one is obviously the uh, GCPOA negotiation uh, that Oman uh, initiated in, in, in secret between um, the United States and Iran. Um, and it has also been active in terms of um, trying to resolve the conflict in Yemen uh, 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 as well. And it's, you know, it's been uh, thanked and acknowledged by. Uh, Saudi Arabia, by uh, uh, the uh, US envoy, um, um, uh, uh, Linda King, and also by uh, the UN uh, uh, envoy, uh, Martin Griffiths, uh, who all uh, have, uh, and as well as, of course, by the United States, who have all thanked Oman for its role in bringing all the different factions uh, in Yemen into uh, some kind of a, a, a dialogue, uh, helping to kind of resolve this uh, uh, devastating war in uh, in Yemen. Um, uh, and there are many other um, uh, instances where Oman has uh, has been, uh, you know, helpful, and maybe even now uh, trying to help um, in 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 one way or the other. Um, the, um, the recent uh, GCPOA uh, negotiation that's taking place in Vienna. Um, uh, Oman has also been trying to help, you know, in the other issues, whether it is the Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, Palestinian issues, and, you know, has even invited uh, Netanyahu to Oman um, uh, as well. Um, and other uh, uh, Israeli uh, leaders to Oman to try and, you know, uh, find the way out and to show that we are all looking for peace and stability in the region. Um, and at the same time, it's try to uh, help uh, in resolving the Gulf uh, uh, crisis. So that has been the history of Oman. It, it's doing it for its own internal, as I said, uh, uh, reasons, and also for all uh, because of its culture. And your question is, you know, whether then the, the new leadership will continue on the same route. I believe it is. They will. Um, Sultan Haytham, who took over immediately uh, uh, a, a year ago, he immediately said, you know, I will continue on the same uh, policies as the previous uh, uh, sultan. There are all the 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 determinants of Omani foreign policy are is still there. It doesn't change. Um, what is going to change is perhaps the style uh, a little bit. Oman is becoming much closer now to its Gulf partners than it was before. I think it's also that the Gulf partners are now seeing the value of having um, you know good relationship with uh, with Oman and. Um, you know, and in the past they were accusing it of being, you know, you're, if you're not with us, you're against us. Now I think they understand that, you know, neutrality actually does sometimes help in at least providing space for people to talk. Um, and as you know, Oman was against the war in Yemen and did not support it and did not involve itself in that, but he's trying to resolve it. So I think in, 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 in short, uh, the, the, I think that will continue. Uh, on the same route because the basis for that foreign policy are, hasn't haven't changed, uh, but the, the it may the style may change a little bit uh, because you know there's been not only change of the leader but also change of the veteran uh, Oman foreign minister and we've got now a young one um, and you know we, we we've got big revamping of the Omani government so there will be. Um, Obviously, there's going to be a change in the style, but not necessarily in the uh, uh, 
on the fundamentals of Oman foreign policy, and I think it will continue to 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 be the same. Um, I think there is going to be very difficult just to very quickly uh, talk about you know the defense on Abraham. I think it's going to be very difficult to see a collective defense uh, agreement that is that is uh, public. There may be something um, that is uh, you know there is a lot of defense and security cooperation that's taking place anyway. But I think it will it will become very sensitive for, for example, the United Arab Emirates or Bahrain to enter with Israel into some kind of a, a public. But, you know, who knows? But I think that will put them under a lot of pressure uh, regionally and domestically as well. Um, and uh, the domestic repercussions of the economic situation, I think, are uh, um, um, uh, are in, in enormous. Before I walked in uh, now to uh, this session, I was called by um, uh, 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 a news agency, and I was in and Hari. I even did not get their name, but I think it was based in Dubai. And they asked me one question, uh, on, but uh, and re relating to uh, a recent speech by the minister, the ex-minister of foreign affairs in Oman, where he uh, said something that it will be um, that the Arab, uh, the Arab world, we may be seeing not just one Arab uh, uprising, but uh, but many. And they asked me, what did I think about that? And what are the conditions for it? And I think, um, you know, I think he is to a certain extent right. Given what I've just explained, you know that um, you know that we have um, we have failed states, we have failing states, and even the wealthy states, especially the ones in the Gulf, are now facing tremendous economic challenges, and the socio-economic issues are really important. You know, especially amongst young people who want jobs, who want prosperity, who want you know uh, future. Uh, uh, Etc. And I think they are. Uh, uh, even the Gulf states are going to be facing uh, challenges. Uh, I'm afraid to say that you know Bahrain and Oman are the two countries that are, uh, uh, you know, the 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 less endowed in terms of their wealth, and and they have experienced some of the Arab uprising, and they could, uh, we could see something happening uh, there. Uh, Hopefully not, but that is uh, something you know to actually uh, uh, think about. And you know, instead of you know regional countries trying to help and support uh, other uh, countries that are facing these uh, domestic issues and economic issues, the, we see it. It's it's been done the other way. They're trying to bully them. Uh, you know, because this goes back to that mentality I was talking about. That that. We're still living in the uh, Middle Ages, where you know one tribe wants to dominate the region uh, or or the area, and this you know zero sum competition is still very much there, and this you know historical antagonism is still continues, and unfortunately that adds to this um, uh, ongoing um, you know economic conditions that the region is uh, is facing, even the wealthier states, you know we are. Despite what we hear about these visions, uh, that uh, almost all of the Gulf states have their own visions, uh, economic visions for the future, um, uh, they are still very much rentier states, the rentier economies, that is very highly dependent on oil income coming to the coffers of the government, spending it on the people, so they are distributive states rather than uh, productive states, and that mentality is. Uh, you know, the rentier mentality and the rentier psychology is very difficult to change. It's not going to be easy. And, you know, we are going to see a very rough, I believe, very rough transition from um, from rentier state to post rentier states. And especially if these, you know, uh, visions don't work, what does it mean? You know, they have not been able to diversify their economies beyond oil and gas. And the oil and prices have said it's difficult to um, live in uh, on that. It's not only that it is um, finite resources, but also you know the oil prices has gone down, uh, and uh, the fundamentals for that 
uh, oil price uh, are that it is going to be very, very difficult to see it going up. And I believe I remember that uh, the one of the most famous uh, Saudi oil ministers, and that is Ahmed Zaki Yamani, who just passed away some time ago, um, um, said something that you know, uh, the, which is very important to remember. And he says that the Stone Age did not finish because you know because of lack of stones, and the Oil Age is not going to finish because of uh, a lack of oil. So we could still have oil, but the Oil Age has has gone. And I think to a certain extent we are seeing kind of the end of the oil age and and if they don't diversify very quickly, uh, which is also going to be very challenging and very difficult and it's not easy to just diversify. It's not just, you know, a leader's wish. It's it's much more hard work and, and, and a change of mentality, change of psychology that has been built over, you know, the last 50 decades of you know, uh, addiction on oil, that is, uh, if that is, uh, if that cannot change, you know, it's going to be, we're going to be facing some uh, really serious uh, issues. Um, so the socioeconomic issues, I think, are, are, are very important. And I very quickly just say, look, uh, uh, regarding the Muslim Brotherhood, it's a very interesting question. Uh, we have to remember that the Muslim Brotherhood were actually the allies of the uh, of the leaders of the Gulf. Uh, when uh, when during the heydays of Arab nationalism and the leftist ideology uh, that was uh, kind of uh, widespread in the Arab uh, region and you know, during Nasser's time and Nasserism and Baathism, the Gulf states found. Uh, an ally and a partner, and that is the Muslim Brotherhood or the Islamic groups. Um, and the Muslim Brotherhood were actually prosecuted by uh, these uh, revolutionary uh, Arab uh, leaders uh, who have this Arab nationalist ideology, and they found refuge in the Gulf. The Gulf needed uh, the know-how and the, uh, uh, the human resources that these people brought because at that time, we didn't have many people in the Gulf who were highly educated or, you know, able to build, you know, and, and, and uh, the bureaucracy or to teach in universities and schools. So they had to import a lot of people or bring in a lot of people from Egypt, from Syria, from Iraq, Palestine, Jordan uh, and, and, and Tunisia and, you know, all the Arab countries. And most of these were actually Muslim Brotherhood and they were um, they were welcomed with warm arms because they worked as an antidote to all the left uh, ideologies uh, at that time, the revolutionary uh, uh, ideologies. Uh, and the, the, the cutoff point, I think, between uh, MB and uh, that's the Muslim Brotherhood and, uh, uh, and the Gulf leader, uh, leaders is during the uh, invasion of Kuwait uh, when uh, they sided with uh, Saddam or during the uh, you know, when, when the Arab countries uh, wanted, or the Gulf countries wanted to ask for help to get Saddam out. And that was that was a big issue, obviously. But I think that was one reason why they had um, um, went against them. And you have to also understand that even within Kuwait and Bahrain, there is a very, very strong component of uh, the Muslim uh, Brotherhood that's still active and still, you know, very much in the government. and. They form very uh, strong part of their uh, parliaments as well. Um, I think what also added to this is is the Arab Spring. Uh, the Arab Spring um, uh, basically um, um, the, the the Muslim Brotherhood saw uh, an opportunity there um, in, in the Arab Spring, and they tried to use it uh, and to take advantage of. Uh, the Arab Street because there was the Arab Street lead, needed leadership and there was no leadership. And in fact, there were hardly any other ideology that really matters at that time. And the only ideology that was really well organized and to a certain extent was the Muslim Brotherhood. So to, they took advantage of that. And that even frightened the Gulf states because the Gulf states is not frightened from the Brotherhood itself. It's frightened from democracy. So if you are uh, any organized group that calls for democracy, they would be against you. They were against the leftists, against the Baathists, against the Nasserites, against anybody who wants to change the status quo. 
And when the Brotherhood started to, you know, side with the Arab street and want to change the status quo, they went against them. However, I think there are elements now we are seeing, you know, reconciliation of the positions. Um, what happened is that some of the Gulf states now realize that actually alienating the Brotherhood has alienated, a, you know, a very powerful part of their Sunni Muslims against what they see as Shia Islam. So they bring in sectarianism in, into this. Um, they also see that there is a need for the Brotherhood in, um, in, in, in Yemen in particular to uh, help them to win the war uh, against what they see is, you know, uh, Ansar Allah or Houthi or supported by Iran uh, and they're accused of being Shia. So they are seeing that there is actually some value in bringing them back. Um, however, this is debated. Saudi Arabia perhaps is less, is more inclined to uh, uh, make a rapprochement with the, uh, with the Brotherhood. The UAE uh, is much more adamant um, about any forms of political Islam. Um, so, you know, there we can see like um, divergence of if you like, of strategies and how to deal uh, with, uh, with the Muslim Brotherhood. And I think the Muslim Brotherhood as well has started to realize that they have made mistakes and, um, and they have, you know, been uh, opportunistic uh, in, in, in so many ways. And I think they are also changing, there is, you know, a call for change in their leadership and so on. So it seems that there is going to be some kind of a reconciliation. You know, we even uh, people are now talking about perhaps Turkey and Saudi Arabia are getting closer to each other um, in um, in um, uh, uh, in the war in Yemen, and you know trying to bring in the Brotherhood there uh, uh, through Hizb al Islah uh, Islah Party, bless you, uh, to uh, to um, you know to help. Uh, to help them so you know we are really in in a situation where there is ever uh, changing uh, politics and changing uh, allies and you know there is nothing that can be ex uh, unexpected in the region if the abraham accord could happen this way anything could happen uh, and as i said earlier this is not something that is institutional it's not some, something that necessarily the public wants it's one person one man at the top who decides that and uh, makes that decision and, and and goes for it and they know that they are unaccountable and they can make anything uh, they want and that is you know that makes politics uh, generally is is uh, of course uh, very precarious and politics are is uh, ever changing uh, you know, with interest, but when it's one person deciding that, it makes it even much more difficult to predict. Who who would have predicted that we're going to have the Abraham Accord? Who would have predicted there's going to be a blockade of Qatar overnight? And who's going to predict that they're going to they're gonna end uh, uh, it in the way that it's uh, it's ended? It's very much uh, personal, um, tribal way of thinking. Thank you very much. Uh, Haritini, just one question and do we finish? <laughs> All right, so the last question uh, will be uh, about the Iran and, and, and nuclear program. And uh, I'm combining two actually questions here uh, it's because they are similar. Uh, but uh, what do you think about uh, if Iran develops further its nuclear program, uh, it would further destabilize the region? And uh, the fact that UAE and uh, uh, Iran are uh, main trading partners. Uh, if there is a way for Saudi, Saudi Arabia in the long term to prevent this uh, strong traditional relationship, trading relationship between the two countries. Okay, um, you seem to pick a very, very hard questions. I, I, um, I think um, uh, the idea of bringing in um, weapons of mass destruction to already a very volatile region is very dangerous. And if these weapons of mass destruction, so however, whatever they are, 
nuclear or biological or anything in the hands, if they fall in the hands of, uh, so trying to explain uh, 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 countries that have leaders who are, you know, very impulsive, uh, they have no uh, checks and balances and they can make, you know, decision overnight uh, themselves without any accountability. That can be very dangerous. Um, and obviously, um, any country that seeks to bring in um, uh, and create, uh, uh, bring in nuclear uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction to the region is not welcomed um, uh, in terms of principle. Uh, that's the last thing we want to see in, uh, in the region. Obviously, there is a very important role for nuclear energy, uh, uh, peaceful nuclear programs to take place. If there are, you know, safeguards built in into that, and if there is under, uh, they are under international uh, agency, uh, atomic agency um, uh, inspections and 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 and, uh, and and control. But uh, to actually move that beyond that to building a nuclear. Uh, um, capability uh, uh, weapons that is uh, obviously dangerous, and I think the GCPOA itself uh, was uh, one way of preventing Iran from, uh, you know, moving ahead towards building that cap capacity, allowing it to have a peaceful program, but not to uh, uh, weaponize uh, that uh, that program. Um, obviously, it has its own shortfalls and it has its own difficulties. And, um, and, and, and I can understand people who criticize it for what it was, but it was the best that it could have been done under the, those circumstances. And I've been speaking to people who were involved in this and I asked, you know, some of the questions that people have asked. What, why didn't you um, put in the missiles into, into this? Uh, uh, or why didn't you include you know regional conflicts and you know i asked those kind of questions and they said to me if you had known and experienced the difficulties and the technical difficulties that we had gone through you would understand why we didn't want to do this it was hard enough to reach this and if we had brought in all kinds of different uh, politics and uh, uh, and uh, issues it would have been impossible um, but I think what, what the, the world has failed is to supplement that with another agreement with, uh, with Iran that could have tackled other issues. Um, but to, uh, to withdraw, for, from my opinion, to just withdraw unilaterally you know, from a, uh, an international agreement like you know, Trump has done uh, and to put Iran under sanction, I don't think that is an, an, under you know, uh, extreme pressure, uh, economic pressure that uh, you know and make the people suffer because of that i don't think that was uh, a good policy and now we are seeing that because of the change in the administration there is a need uh, there is a uh, a willingness to actually go back to the the negotiation which is uh, as we you know talking i think is taking place uh, or it's in the process um and hopefully that will lead to uh, some kind of uh um, you know, going back to the GCPA with some, perhaps some amendments, but also to build in other issues that, uh, that the, the region and the world want from Iran, and that is mainly the, its missile capability and also its, uh, um, you know, um, regional files. Um, but we also have to think that, you know, um, this is also pushing other countries in the region to go nuclear. If Iran was to go nuclear, Saudi Arabia said it will do so. Um, and, and they have announced that um, by whatever means. Oh, we never know what that means, but you know they will definitely try and, and do so. And as you know, there is uh, already a Saudi nuclear program. There is already a UAE nuclear program. Um, and you know that, that kind of proliferation of nuclear programs um, can be dangerous unless they are actually under some kind of very very strict uh, condition, and we've seen what happens in what happened in Chernobyl, and we've seen what happened here in Japan uh, as well, uh, even from uh, a very peaceful uh, and nuclear power programs. Um, so uh, I I I hope that you know part of any kind of regional structure is to talk about this. 
um, you know, to and, and include these kind of programs under a regional um, uh, uh, supervisory uh, body and international supervisory body to ensure um, the safety and stability of uh, the peaceful programs, but also to ensure that they do not trans, uh, transform into uh, uh, into uh, armament, as it were. And very briefly on UAE, Iran, obviously UAE, Iran are, has all, they've always been a very uh, important trading partners, especially Dubai in particular, that uh, has a very large number of Iranian uh, nationals who live there and have been living there for a very long time and they established uh, trading routes uh, uh, there and Dubai being a re-export center, a re-export uh, port, uh, 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 as it were, uh, he heavily relies on that relationship. Um, and any um, any kind of change to that really can affect Dubai in particular, but the UAE in general, uh, economic uh, well-being. You know, uh, Dubai has suffered a lot. Uh, because of some of the political policy, uh, not not al not least the Arab uh, the uh, uh, the boycott or the blockade against Qatar, because you know Dubai used to actually export a lot uh, to uh, Qatar uh, before uh, that crisis uh, happened, um, and you know Dubai doesn't have the oil that Abu Dhabi has, and therefore it's very much reliant on uh, on its uh, on its trade. Um, now, to what extent can Saudi Arabia, uh, and then, sorry, we can see that the UAE has always been trying, wherever things get bad, you know, to keep that good relationship with Iran. There is always overtures from UAE to, towards Iran, and they're trying to keep things calm and, 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 and reasonable. Um, well, you know, it depends what happens with Saudi Arabia and the Iranian talks, uh, as has been reported, that has been taking place. But if there was a rapprochement between the two, I think that situation will, you know, will not arise, uh, as it were, uh, to pressurize UAE to, uh, uh, to you know, lessen its trade uh, relations with Iran. But if it does, it's going to be very difficult to do so uh, as well, because you know, the future of Dubai and the well-being of Dubai is actually reliant on that, on the trade, not just on the Iranian, but on the trade in general. And that could really badly affect uh, uh, Dubai uh, 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 economy. Um, and uh, I don't think UAE would be very happy to uh, to do so. And I, I think as uh, we are also seeing, there is already some kind of um, competition happening between uh, Dubai and Saudi Arabia. Uh, as you know, Dubai has always been the base for many international companies that want to move to the Gulf region, uh, they made Dubai a space for a lot of obvious reason. The ease of, you know, doing business there, the uh, the, the local conditions, etc., the freedom uh, uh, that people enjoy in Dubai and, uh, um, and the history of the place uh, as well as, you know, a free trading port, uh, as it were. Um, what we are seeing now is actually a, a, a battle to take that away uh, from Dubai by the Saudi government. Uh, uh, as you've seen that Saudi has recently announced that any company, international company that wants to do business in Saudi Arabia has to have its headquarters in Saudi Arabia. So um, that is you know, being read by some that this is actually an economic war against Dubai or, or UAE at large. And if this is, uh, if this is, um, if you add to that pressure um, regarding trade with with Iran, that could uh, really exasperate the the situation. So I don't think this is uh, this is going to happen, and I think hopefully there is going to be some kind of uh, a rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran. As you know, Iran has 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 been calling for some kind of a dialogue in the past. Uh, obviously, it ha there are lots of uh, mistakes that Iran has made uh, in in the region, and you know made the Saudis very upset and very angry, and they don't want to talk to them. But you know, uh, I think there there is a limit to how angry you are when you know that there, this is you know 
costing not only uh, the region, but it could also cost you at home. Uh, you know, these conflicts have not really helped anybody. Iran, despite all of its problems and despite all the maximum pressure that it is under, has actually shown that has, it has all, won almost all the conflicts uh, uh, in the region. And, you know, some Iranians would brag that we control four Arab capitals. And, uh, and now it's annoying Saudi Arabia uh, through um, the war in, in Yemen, you know, and every drone that uh, a, a Houthi, uh, um, you know, throws at Saudi Arabia is, you know, it that costs Saudi Arabia a fortune to, to protect that uh, financially, but also politically. Uh, that, that war has been very, very, very costly to Saudi Arabia. And Iran knows this, and it, it, it is really, you know, got Saudi Arabia in a corner there. Um, so I think Saudi Arabia knows now that it has to negotiate its way out of the war in Yemen, and they can only do that if also they can have a talk with, uh, uh, with Iran. And I hope that is going to happen because, you know, as I said earlier, um, conflicts cannot be avoided. Misunderstanding always happens, even within, uh, uh, you know, within own family, as it were, let alone, you know, in, with states of different interests. But if there were like a, some kind of a, a regional mechanism, a regional uh, organization that these countries can talk uh, and develop a relationship that can be useful. I hope this is something that, you know, the region can start to think that they should do, you know, they could learn from European experience, whether it's the EU or the organization, uh, Cooperation for Europe, um, but also in, in other countries, in South America, in Africa, in Asia, there are lots of different organizations that can help to diffuse conflicts and keep the dialogue going. That is something we don't, we lack in, in the region. And that's something we definitely uh, need and we should all work towards uh, um, you know, nudging something uh, to to help us out of the way. It's obviously not going to resolve all the crises or the problems, but it can at least uh, form uh, a venue for for dialogue and for you know and 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 for uh, understanding uh, and and alleviate any misperception that we have. Most of these conflicts is actually uh, are also obviously historically based ideologically based, ethnically, um, sectarian, but also misunderstanding plays a very important part in this. You know, you misunderstand one action and you take another and that's misunderstood and it escalates. We, we, we could do that through some kind of a mechanism that can help to de-escalate tension and to create a, a kind of a, a dialogue and relationship and build a relationship Co uh, you know, a cooperative relationship between the region because no country on its own can really affect its own development without having to work with uh, its wider uh, region. And you cannot just box one country into, you know, into a corner. We tried that with Iran. Uh, we've, you know, tried to close the doors uh, uh, with Iran and we have seen they have, you know, been able to creep in through the windows as it were. Um, you know, so we we need to understand that those kind of policies don't work. Um, we need to, you know, uh, grow up in, in the way that uh, the region has to uh, confront its future together uh, in, a, in a, with, you know, with a rational way of thinking rather than the old traditional um, way of antagonism, of rivalry, of deceit, of, you know, uh, conspiracy and all of that. We've got to overcome that, but that I, I understand. I say that with trepidation because I know most of it is wishful thinking, but you know, without wishful thinking, how can we survive when we see all these conflicts around us? Yes, thank you very much. As the, there is a saying that uh, uh, the romantics are the only re realists. <laughs> so those who are romantics are the only realists in the world because they can they can uh, plan for the future. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we are grateful for uh, this uh, 
presentation uh, for your talk and for all the all the discussion of the all your answers in uh, and the response in your the questions uh, it's uh, uh, almost uh, two hours now in this uh, in this meeting in this uh, event we hope and we wish that we have the opportunity to invite you to come to Greece and talk us uh, uh, about these uh, themes after the the end of this uh, uh, difficult situation and uh, we know that we are now we are at the end of not at the end we are Near, nearly the end of a hectic day and also you are at the end of your uh, Ramadan day now and uh, you, you didn't have uh, your, 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 your dinner yet. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for thinking of that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and uh, It's a pleasure to come back to uh, Greece. It's one of my favorite countries. Uh, and uh, yeah, it'll be great to, uh, to come back and to meet you in person. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you all of you that you attend uh, this uh, this meeting. Stay always tuned with our YouTube uh, uh, events, and we we will be back uh, in in about a month or or less uh, with the, with a new uh, event on the Middle East. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bowood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really appreciate Bye -bye. it. Bye. -bye. Bye. Τελειώσαμε έτσι. Να ακούει κανείς. Yeah.